When I started modding, I wanted to make a Seiko version of Omega's Planet Ocean. I started with the SNZH55 with the hopes of a simple hand and bezel insert swap would give me something that would look close enough to satisfy me at the time. And I actually had something pretty good. I had a blue Seiko 5 in Planet Ocean style. But a defective bezel insert led me down the path of various mods which I wasn't happy with and ultimately left me with a pretty scruffy and disappointing 55 Fathoms mod. I found myself saying, you should have just built an SKX007. With all the modding options the SKX007 has, it would have been the obvious choice, right? This build even got a bit of a start late last year when I tried to do it with a Sari 57 dial, but I just thought I could do better, do more with it. I even experimented with it a bit, using some different parts and mixing colours to see what a blue and orange Planet Ocean might look like with an aftermarket SKX dial, and although it was interesting, it wasn't what I was looking for, so ultimately that became my SKX007 spare parts build, which is getting an upgrade by the way, so stay tuned for that one. But this time, I'm going to build the watch that I should have built. What will hopefully be a worthy Seiko adaptation of the Omega Planet Ocean. This is the SKX Atlantis. So the parts, to start with we've got an SKX007 case with 3 o'clock crown position, no crown guards and drilled lug holes from Namaki Mods. Then we've got an LX bezel from Crystal Times. This one I think is really going to make this look like a Planet Ocean with that gear cog look. Then we've got a signed S coin edge crown and stem from Namaki Mods. This I sized the stem up when I previously built this so it's all ready to go. Then here we've got the NH36 which from the previous iteration of this build I've already put black C3 calendar plates on it. Then for the hands, we've got some Yaboki Speedmaster arrow tipped hands with an orange tipped second hand to inject some colour into the dial space. Unfortunately, like my 55 Fathoms build, it's C1 loom so it won't be as bright, but you know, it's what I have here, so. Then we have the Crystal Time CT239 Sapphire Display Case Pack, and this is the Type B version so that we can use it with the NH36 and its shorter grey movement spacer, and we won't get any gaps between the chapter ring and the dial. Then we've got an orange aluminium Planet Ocean style bezel insert with Loom Pip from eBay. And of course the adhesive ring to stick that on. Then for the dial, the star of the show, we have the Seiko OEM Stargate 2 SRP495K1 dial from Watch Parts Plaza. Then we've got an SKX007 chapter ring from Namaki Mods with a matte black finish and orange indexes to inject a bit more of that orange colour into the dial space. And this one is metal, it's not plastic, so that's a bonus. Then of course we have our various gaskets, bezel, case back, crystal. Here we've got the click ring or click spring for the bezel. And then in here we've got some double domed sapphire crystal with clear AR coating from Namaki Mods. And last but not least, we have a Miltat strap code bracelet with a nice solid milled clasp, screw links, solid end links, and nice polishing to boot. So that's enough waffling about the parts. Let's build it, shall we? So once we've got it in the movement holder, the first thing I like to do is make sure that it's still functioning. So here I'm just checking the natural date change and then checking the switching of the day and date and that feels fine nothing strange going on there so we can get to the dial so I'm just gonna test fit the dial just to see what dial feet are on there and as I thought it's 3.8 o'clock feet which is no good for the case we're using so I'm gonna have to cut those feet off file them down and use dial dots Just gently applying pressure as I file this to make sure it goes nice and flat and then just cleaning up any bits left over with some Rotico. And that's all we can do for the moment since we're using dial dots we're going to have to assemble the case so that we can line it up with the chapter ring so let's give the case a little clean with some Rotico and then put in the chapter ring. Yeah it looks like that's not going in properly the uh, the little notch that goes into the slot is too large so I'm going to file that down, clean it up with some Rotico and after about 20 minutes of filing and checking the fitment I'm ready to dab off any particles with a piece of Rotico and then I can put on a temporary case back just to help it sit on the plastic pieces that I'm going to screw into the crystal press. Then in goes the crystal gasket with the lip on the inside facing down and then after polishing the crystal as much as I can I can place it on the top 
lift everything into the crystal press and attempt to press the glass in. Yeah, you know what? I'm going to try a smaller bit to push that in. Yeah, let's see how that works. Mm, yeah, I don't like that. That's going in at an angle. Let's take it out, pop the glass out and try again. Okay, here we go. Take two. Try and get it as centered as I can. Yeah, it doesn't want to go in straight, does it? Let's use a different plastic piece for the bottom to help it stay centered. Make sure the crystal's on there nice. I'm using a larger bit this time to press it in as well in the hopes that it will go down straight. Looks like it's going in slightly an angle, but you know what? I'm going to just try and rotate the case just to apply pressure on a slightly different point, see how it goes. Yeah, there we go. That's better. What is it they say? Third time's the charm? No, that's looking pretty good. So, to my eye here, this looks straight. And now that the crystal's pressed in, that chapter ring is exactly where it's gonna be, so we can use the case to check the fitment and alignment of the dial. So, let's get on with the dial dots. And as you can see, I've cut a strip of the dial dots off the paper so that they're half the size they would normally be, so they're less intrusive on the date disc. So I'm just peeling them off the backing with the tweezers and then using my finger to gently press it so that I can pull the tweezers away and then press down on top to make sure that it's firmly stuck to the movement spacer. Oh, would you look at that? That one doesn't even want to stick. Let's try again. And we just press it down and again, look at that. It doesn't want to stick. It's like a slip and slide. What is going on? Let's try another one. Let's see if this one's actually stuck to it. Yeah, that's much better. So I'm just going to use four dial dots on this one. Just make sure that they're all pressed down and adhered to the dial holding spacer. Then we can peel off the yellow backing to reveal the adhesive on the top side. And that one wants to come off in layers. Let's try again. There you go. So here we go. Here's the hard part. So I'm just trying to lower it into place here, making sure that what's inside the date window seems in alignment, as well as the little white marker at the three o'clock is in alignment with the crown. So this is where the difficulty in using dial dots begins. At this point, it looks like it's in perfect alignment. So let's get it inside the case, since we've assembled it for that very purpose, and make sure that it is. So I've just taken the crown out off camera so we can get it in the case and check the alignment. And as you can see, it needs to be rotated clockwise. So let's get it out and try again. So just gently prying it up with a screwdriver. And look at that, the dial dots aren't sticking very well anyway. So you know what? I'm gonna make some new ones out of a bezel adhesive ring instead. And then we can try again. Let's see if it's in alignment this time. Yes, look at that. Now, this did take me four attempts to align it just right, but that's looking pretty good. So let's move on and put the hands on. Let's get it back in the movement holder. And here we go. So I'm just setting the time here so the date ticks over and we know it's 12 o'clock and then we can put on the hour hand. Look at that. Can you see my hands shaking there? I really don't want to screw this one up. So let's press the hour hand on with just the right amount of pressure so it doesn't go down too far. And then we can just look at it from the side to see how much space there is between the dial and the hand and to make sure it's level. Then give it a full rotation to make sure that it's not interfering with anything on the dial. And then just to make sure that it's level, I'm just gonna press on the back of it just a little bit and double check that it is straight. And then give it a clean with a piece of Rotico, ready to put the minute hand on. This is the hard part, the minute hand. So I'm just using the hand press here to make sure that it's on the post in the middle, which I think is called the cannon pinion. And then once it's aligned, we can press it down, but not too far. And then check the spacing between that and the hour hand. And if it needs to, we'll just press on the back of it just to level it off a little bit more so that there's a better spacing between the two hands and give it a full rotation to make sure they're not interfering with each other. And here's what I mean by hard part. I'm giving it the nudge test here because it looked like it was in alignment, but after a full rotation, it wasn't. 
So I'm going to check it again, and then I'm going to give it the double nudge test where you hold the hour in place with one pusher and use the other to push the minute hand to try and fix the alignment. And it ticks over just before 12. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm happy with that, but I'm going to go ahead and put the second hand on anyway. So I'm looking at it from the side so that I can see the second hand go onto the pin, and then I'm just gently pushing it on so that I know it is on the pin. Then we can give it a firm push to make sure that it's gone on properly. Yeah, look at that. You see how far it goes on there? So then all that's left to do is check the spacing between the minute hand and the second hand and make sure that there's enough, and that looks very close. So at this point, I've decided that I'm not happy with the spacing or the alignment, so they're coming off, and we're going to do it again. So I'm just using a plastic bag to protect everything, and then a hand puller to cleanly pull up the hands, and then I can repeat the whole process. I did this bit off camera just because it was easier to do so at the time, but the spacing turned out pretty decent the second time, and although the alignment's not flawless, it was good enough that I was happy to move forward, because every time you take the hands off, you just risk damaging them, and frankly, I don't think I was going to get the spacing much better than it was here, so at least it ticks over a couple minutes after 12. I'm just, I, I don't know what it is about these Speedmaster hands, I can never get them perfectly aligned. Still, good enough that I'm happy to move on with it, so I'm just going to spritz the dial with some compressed air, and then we can case it up. And we're starting to get an idea of what it's going to look like now. Let's make sure that's pressed in all the way. And then comes the crown and stem. And now that it's inside the case, just checking again to make sure that everything's functioning properly and nothing's catching. Then we can add some silicon grease to the case back gasket. Then make sure that's seated and clean that fiber off as well. Then we can spray a bit of air on the inside of the case back and then screw it down. Next is the bezel, so we can put the adhesive backing on there, and these ones fit absolutely perfectly. And then we can lubricate and insert the bezel gasket. Then we'll just give the bezel area a quick clean with a piece of Rotico. And then we can just place the click spring on there in the two holes. Then we just lay the bezel on top, ready to be pressed into place with the crystal press. Wait for it. There it is. Then let's check the rotation. Then we can peel off the adhesive backing, ready for the insert, and make sure that the bezel is in its resting position so that when we line it up, it stays that way. So there's our first glimpse at the final product. Let's pop this bracelet on. Now wait a minute, we can do better than that. I've now got an even better sloped bezel insert that seriously looks so much better than the flat one. Essentially I'm going to show you how to change a bezel insert for an SKX007, like the proper way, I think. And this time I'm going to align the bezel not only with the 12 o'clock position on the dial and the chapter ring, but a single tooth on the gear-shaped pattern on the LX bezel. Why? Because it looks better. So let's get this one off and then put this sloped insert on here. Ah yes, the dreaded pry tool, scratcher of cases and destroyer of bezels. So you just push the bezel tool into this seam here, and then when it goes forward, you tip it back slightly, and it pops off. Just like that. It's actually really easy. You don't need to pry anything against the crown. As long as you push into that seam, it will come off. So next, I'm just using something soft like a piece of plastic to push underneath the insert and get it unstuck. Because if you use something metal, you risk scratching the bezel, so it's always better to use something plastic here, or maybe something wooden if you've got it. Then you just rotate it around here to just get the insert unstuck. And then we can simply pull it free. So let's swap this out for the good one. 
So this one's already got adhesive pre-applied to it, so all we need to do is clean this off. So first, we're going to scratch the majority of the residue off with something plastic that won't ruin the metal. Or you can use your nails as long as you sort of clump the adhesive up and then pull it back and then it just pulls itself away as you scrape it with your thumbnail. And then you can pull it off and then for the rest of the residue it's as simple as using a q-tip with some acetone on it because i've tried ipa on things like this it's not very good acetone eats through the adhesive nice and fast and you're not going to damage the metal with acetone then i'm just wiping off any residue with a polishing cloth then I'm just cleaning the outer side of the bezel with some more acetone on a q-tip because sometimes when you're scraping off the adhesive it can get smudged onto the outer metal parts. So now that it's clean we're ready to put the bezel back on. Then we can check the rotation and click action. That is buttery smooth. So just like before, putting the bezel in its resting position so that nothing shifts out of alignment once we put the insert in. Then I'm just making sure that a single tooth on the bezel is aligned with the 12 o'clock point because it looks better. Then I'm just giving it one last wipe with IPA on a Q-tip and then wiping it with the dry side to get rid of any residue. Then I'm just going to do a quick test fit because this insert was not designed for an SKX. It's ever so slightly different in size, but it seems to fit so we can go ahead and apply it very carefully trying to line up that triangle with the 12 o'clock point before I drop it down and press it into place making sure that it's lined up with those lines and if it falls out of place you just try and shift it just a bit like that just before you press it down that looks pretty good so I'm just holding it in place and then pressing it down with a polishing cloth so that I don't you know smudge or damage it in any way then give it one full rotation just to make sure that it lines back up again. Nice. Look at that. That insert is so much better. Look at the way it glistens and sparkles in the light. Let's do another upgrade. We're going to throw in a gear-shaped crown as well, because why not? It's just going to bring home that Planet Ocean look, which of course means sizing up a new stem, which took me several tries to get it where I was happy with it. So once that's sized up, we can get some two-part epoxy here just to keep it secure on the stem. And just dab the end of the stem in there. And then we can very carefully align the threads on the crown and then screw it on and wipe away any excess afterwards. So I got this crown here from Namaki Mods and as you can see, the crown tubes are different lengths. The gear crown here was from eBay and it's I needed a much longer stem in there so shame they're not identical just with different crown patterns but anyway let's get that new crown in. Now I could have just edited this together just showing me putting in the final bezel insert and the final crown but I think it's worth showing the full path that the build has taken because not everything goes off without a hitch whether it's putting in the crystal or setting the hands or whether you think the bezel insert you've got could be better. I think these parts of the process are worth showing. I think at the very least it shows you that not every build is a perfect sequence of consecutively successful steps in the assembly process, that some builds do have some speed bumps and others just smash straight into a brick wall. Now fortunately with this one there was no smashing into a brick wall unlike my 55 Fathoms mod. But anyway, I think it's finally done. So let's get some b-roll shall we? So here it is, the SKX Atlantis. Why Atlantis? Well, in the TV series Stargate Atlantis, the city Atlantis was on the ocean, and this is a planet ocean homage, and of course the connection to Stargate because it uses the Stargate 2 dial, and I'm pretty sure that Stargate Atlantis was the second Stargate series after SG-1, so 
Atlantis 2, Stargate Atlantis, Planet Ocean, Atlantis was on the ocean, you get the point. So I think I'll start with the negatives here. It's a shame about the C1 loom on the hands, but I ordered these the same time I ordered the parts for my 55 Fathoms build, and I was hoping that the C1 loom would still glow green in the dark, but appear much more white in normal light, giving that cleaner look rather than being slightly green all the time. And it definitely does that, it's just not very bright as a consequence of that, nor does the loom last very long, but, you know, it's what I've got, and, you know, they're not terrible, it's... it's it's serviceable loom. I also didn't get the alignment of the hands perfect. I managed to get the spacing pretty decent, but in terms of the alignment, the hour hand is ever so slightly crooked, and I, I just don't know what it is about these Speedmaster hands. Every time I try and align them, it looks like it's decent, and then after a full rotation, suddenly it's not aligned anymore. But, you know, I, it's it's so negligible that most of the time you don't notice it. And I'm just one of those people that if I've built something or been through the process of something, I see the faults, you know, but I think it's it's passable. So I'm going to let it go. The gear shaped crown was also a bit stiffer than the coin edge one that I had originally. That one was silky smooth and this one's just slightly stiffer than I would like, but not terrible. Just, you know, I noticed it. So I'm glad that I sized a new stem for it rather than taking the one out of the coin edge one and moving it over. Especially since I would have had to have resized it anyway because of the differences in the sizes of the two crowns. So what about the positives? I absolutely love the way that the orange indexes on the chapter ring and the orange tip on the second hand inject that orange colour scheme into the dial space to make up for the fact that the dial itself doesn't have any orange print on it like the Planet Ocean does. And I think the gear-shaped crown and bezel really do set this off as a Planet Ocean homage. Speaking of the bezel, this LX bezel is the best bezel I have bought for an SKX mod yet. It is absolutely buttery smooth. Listen to this. Oh, that is absolutely smooth. It's like butter. I also really like how the indices on the dial extend further than the coverage of the loom with that extra surface area of polished metal that just plays with the light. And I mean Seiko's Lumi Bright is just fantastic, as well as their print on their dials. It might not be an applied Seiko logo, but I, the print on their dials is just so clean and sharp. Like, Seiko really do make nice dials, don't they? Now, it was a pretty rainy and gloomy day today, but that's not going to stop me going outside to get the obligatory daylight shot so that we can see how it looks in natural light. Even if it gets a bit wet, not that the planet ocean would mind, nor does this goose. And I've got to say, even on a rainy, gloomy day like this, it really does play wonderfully with the light. I mean, look at it. Absolutely stunning. I, I really do love the orange and black colour scheme. It's great. And while we're at it, let's see this on a few different straps, shall we? This is a 22mm orange leather strap, and although the strap itself is not as vibrant as the rest of the watch, I don't think it looks half bad. And there it is on my 6 inch wrist. I think if you're someone who likes leather straps, the leather strap is not a bad look for this one. And then here it is on an orange NATO. Now this one is a bit brighter and a bit more vibrant. It's still not quite as red as the rest of the watch, but pretty decent these NATO straps, especially for the money. This was only about three quid and it's actually quite a comfortable strap. So let's get this one on wrist as well. I think this one definitely pairs well with this because the NATO strap's got a nice bright orange to it. And then here it is on a Jubilee bracelet, and this one has solid end links and screw links with a Seiko stamped clasp, which is pretty nice. I've got to say, these Jubilee bracelets are quite comfortable on wrist, and I do like the way that the polished middle links on this one play with the light. And of course, let's get another wrist shot of it on the Oyster bracelet, which is the one that I'm going to be leaving it on. It's, uh, you can't go wrong with the Oyster three link look, I think it's a, it's a pretty good choice for most watches. Well, I think I've waffled on about this one quite enough, so I hope you've enjoyed coming along with me for the process. I certainly enjoyed putting this one together, albeit my nerves were fried by the end of this build process because I was desperate not to screw this one up, especially after my 55 Fathoms build. And especially since I'm not one of those modders that builds like 10 of them and then sells them. This is the only one. This is it. Anyway, when it's all said and done, although it's definitely not perfect, I think this one turned out all right. So thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.
Good grief! Is my eye still, like, red and bloodshot? These bright lights are absolute murder on my eyes. Oh well, makes the shot look good, doesn't it? <laughs>